Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I get to be here today with Mary DeMuth, who joined us for our Praying Christian Women conference recently. And um, But for those of you that don't know her, she's an author of how many books, Mary? 46. 46 books. She's an <laughs> author of 46 books, a whole lot. Um, she is a literary agent. She's a speaker. She's just an amazing person. So I can't wait to share this conversation with you. Um, we're going to be talking specifically about her book, Love, Pray, Listen, which is her most recent book, I believe. And so thanks, Mary, for being here to talk about that. My pleasure. So great to be here. And thanks for having me on. All right. Well, before we get into the book, I would love to ask you, we ask all of our guests, what your favorite prayer closet is? Where do you go to feel close to God? Um, either on a walk outside or um, just next to my bed kneeling. Yeah, I a lot of people bring in the outdoor component and just this idea of connecting with God in nature. And I think just with our busy kind of a lot of times screen based lives or at, at the very least indoor lives, um, it can just be good and refreshing to just get out with God in mm -hmm. nature. Yeah. Well, um, what would you talking about your book, Love, Pray, Listen, which is just all about how to pray for your adult children, um, kind of this process of letting go and how that affects our prayer lives. So what inspired you to write this particular book and who are you, who did you have in mind for it to be for? It's really for the parent of a wayward adult kid that could even be a teenager um, of a child that maybe is deconstructing their faith or has walked away from the historic Christian faith or has made some sexual decisions that are difficult to um, navigate or uh, maybe has a different political view than you. And there's just a distance there in the relationship. And so what I did was I, I did a deep dive into 1 Corinthians 13, the love is patient, love is kind passage, uh, went back to the Greek and um, exegeted that for the sake of helping us understand what does love really look like? Because when Paul wrote that, he wasn't writing it to people just about to get married or walk the aisle. He was actually writing it for a broken community in Corinth. And so these principles are for people in broken community. And I, I can't think of a more difficult broken community than between parent and adult child. Oh, that is so good. And, you know, I, the more I read the Bible, especially just in the last few years, I don't know if it's because just the years surrounding COVID were so charged with division and just um, kind of ugliness all around, whether it was political or social or spiritual or church-based. Um, and, but I, I've just come to see so much of scripture that I used to kind of picture as being for me personally, as the, you know, Jesus died for you if you were the only one on the planet, which is true. But that was that self-centered faith. I feel like I've, I'm reading so much of Jesus's heart and God's heart for unity within the body of Christ in particular. And I love how you bring that in to this chapter that we tend to read at weddings and think of as a love your husband or wife chapter. I, I really think it's powerful to like to take that. And, and I love your, just all of the Greek explorations. There were so many words that just really when you read them in their original form, it really opens doors that that aren't opened when we read it in English. So I love the way you do that throughout the book. Um, so this, this whole book is based on this first Corinthians 13, and you've got, um, you know, a chapter on love is patient, love is kind. And so when you were doing that, when you were going through this, whether it was looking in the Greek or just reading it through the lens of praying for your kids, did anything surprise you that, or, or be unexpected as you uncovered it and how it applies to our relationship with our children? I think it was a conversation I had with my husband because I was starting the, the boastful chapter, not boastful. And I was like, I'm having a hard time figuring out how this relates to parenting. And we had a really good conversation about this internal process of boasting that we have as parents. So we either have an internal shame of, 
I did must have done something wrong for my child to turn out this way. Or we have an internal boasting of I did everything right and look how great they turned out. Or there is this other kind of silent thing that's going on where we are constantly comparing ourselves to other families and we're either boasting or we're um, wallowing in shame. Mm, And that is not the act of love. And it's not the correct lens to look through because the Lord has created each family uniquely different. And we are simply called with what we have in front of us not an idealized version of what we want, but the reality of what we have in front of us. And we are called to be faithful to the reality that we actually have and not compare our families to other families. That is so good. And it's funny because the chapter that you found so hard at first to, to apply was the one that I got the most out of. I felt like Mm -hmm. it was so relatable. I listened to it as an audio book. And as I was listening, I was like nodding my head and being, yes, yes. And just even as you were talking about it. So I want you to repeat that many times we're either boasting about like our, about our accomplishments or wallowing in shame. And that sums up a lot of my parenting life. Honestly, (laughs) it really is sad. It's very, it's a, it's a humbling (laughs) realization, but it really does sum up so much wallowing in regret or shame. I was just thinking about this this morning about a couple of things that I was like, what did I do wrong to have this thing happen that this person over here and isn't having happening? And I don't think they work this hard. (laughs) And that was in your book. And it reminded me of this chapter where you said, you know, sometimes we look around and we're like, I think I'm putting in the work to try and, you know, I, I, I am putting in the work to try and point my kids to God. And this person over here, I don't think they're putting that work in and their kids seem like they're not struggling at all. And obviously (laughs) a that's wrong thinking and we're centered on ourselves. B it's probably not true. I'm sure everyone's got their Mm -hmm. stuff. The more we get to know people, the more we realize everybody's got their stuff. We just don't see it. But that was so compelling. Like I, it, it has really driven me in the last, I guess, couple of weeks since I read that to, to go to God and just confess that heart of boastfulness or pride or envy and to repent of it. And just every time, but it, it's wonderful because it does come to mind as soon as those feelings, which before were kind of an undercurrent of shame or, or an undercurrent of boastfulness. And then you end up riding this roller coaster of ups and downs and ups and downs. And you're kind of beholden to the situation with your kids. If they're doing great, which happens for a little while, then you're all happy and feeling like, Hey, I'm a great parent. Let me pat myself on the back. And then when they're struggling, you're wallowing in shame. And that is not what God wants for us. And so I love that it has, it used to be kind of an unspoken roller coaster that I wasn't aware of, but your book and that chapter in particular really brought it to the forefront of my mind. So this morning when it came to my mind, I just, I went to God with it and I just gave Mm -hmm. it to him and said, okay, I'm imperfect. I I do struggle with this, get to the bottom of that. And what can I be thankful for? Where can I see you working in this? Because you promise that in all things, in the struggles of our kids, in our struggles, in our failures as parents, in our successes, you're going to be at work. So anyway, thank you for that chapter. (laughs) I'm glad you can thank my husband for that train of thought too. (laughs) That's really good. Well, what could you say? What would you say to the woman listening right now? Who's just like, yes, I get it. Like that's feeling that kind of envy and frustration. What words of advice would you give her? First, I would say, I mean, one of the things that helped me was to realize I was raised by wolves and then I met Jesus. So, I mean, it just, the formula is not, doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And although we have probably consumed a lot of parenting books and tried to do all the right things, there is no surefire formula. And how I, I kind of take the pressure off myself is to go back to the garden of Eden and realize that in the garden of Eden, you had a perfect place. Um, It was Nirvana (laughs) and a perfect parent. And God still had adult kids who were wayward. (laughs) And so if the Lord of heaven and earth who created everything, who is the perfect father had wayward adult children on a grand scale, and then um, extend that to the entire human race, billions and billions of people, 
then it is normative and normal for kids to stray. Now, I don't mean that we shouldn't hope that they don't or pray that they don't, but it takes a bit of the pressure off that um, God, I, I love that the Lord gives me free will, but I don't love that he gives it to my adult children, <laughs> but he loves them as much as he loves me. And he wants them to love him as much as possible. And that can only come with freedom and the freedom to choose. And so that thing I love so much that he has graced my kids with, I have to accept for them as well. That is a really, I, and I, you did talk about this in your book and it's just, you just brought it back to mind about the perfect father had wayward kids mm -hmm. and yet he used that waywardness to bring about redemption of the planet through Jesus mm -hmm. um, to show and display his love in a way that he couldn't have had we never fallen. Um, and he's a redeemer. And I love that. And yeah, I, that's, that is really comforting to hold on to and just to be like, okay, he's in this, I, I just do my best and I offer it like the, the loaves and the fish, you know, the meager, whatever you have to offer of what you can do in your strength, you offer to him and, and pray that in his strength, he'll empower you to do the rest and that you'll look back and one day see what he was doing. And, and yeah, so, um, so when you, uh, when you were writing this book, did you have a favorite chapter as you were writing it or as you look back on it? I think it's, it's the very last one that it, it never ends. It never fails. It continues. Love continues. Mm -hmm. And that to me is something I can control in a way. Like when your kids become adults, you realize all that control you thought you had when they were toddlers is all a mirage. <laughs> Back when you and thought the, you... the hardest part of parenting was figuring out how to get them to sleep through the night yeah, and yeah. feed on a schedule and <laughs> And then they leave the home or they get a driver's yeah. license and they drive away and you realize mm -hmm. none of it was real. You didn't have no. any control anyway. Yeah. But what I realized I could control is I could love them. I could always pray for them. And if I'm still in a relationship with them, because sometimes there's some ghosting that goes on, some canceling on both sides, both, both by parents and by kids. And so then you can't listen, but if there is a relationship there, you can always be a good listener. And so those are the things that I can control, so to speak. And that gives me a level of comfort that I'm not called to force them to uh, jump into the mold that I have for them. I am called to be faithful, to love and pray and listen. Yeah. Well, of those three of like showing Christ-like love, praying for and listening to our kids, do you think that one of them is harder than the other two? Yeah, listening is the hardest. And um, that's because we have forgotten how. <laughs> to listen. Oh, yeah. We don't Just do a good a job society. of society. Yeah. <laughs> In our social media craze, we have become two megaphones that only want to air our opinions and we don't know the art of listening. And to be in a posture of humility too when you're listening. So here's an example of you know having a conversation around the table and my adult kids, none of us all have the same opinions about anything. We're all different human beings and so we might discuss a hotbed issue like abortion. And if I take a listener's posture, what's been interesting is I love finding common ground and you mm -hmm. can't find it unless you listen. And so even though we may disagree fundamentally on a lot of issues there, we, we could agree on the fact that it is really important that young mothers flourish and that we as a society help people who find themselves in those difficult situations. And so that didn't come about by me um, saying a bunch of my views that came by asking questions and being very curious. And it's what I call having a holy curiosity of your adult kids. And one of the things that I, I mentioned in the book that I think might be helpful for your listeners is to look at your adult kids as if they are your new neighbor that moved into the neighborhood. 
And Mm -hmm. with that new neighbor, you wouldn't be like, let me tell you all my political opinions. And let me, you wouldn't just like start with that. You would start by, and you wouldn't care what their political opinions were necessarily. You just want to know them. You'd bring them bread that you baked if they're not gluten-free and you listen to them and you find out what their needs are and you get their mail when it's time. And, and you just develop a relationship that is not based on any sort of past experience. The problem is with adult kids, we've got all of this record of the past. Like you, I changed your diaper. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I know when you were worshiping in church and I know all those things, but if you can kind of divorce that a little bit and treat them as if they are your new neighbor and just have this curiosity about them, I think things will go a little better for you. That's really good. I think that is such good advice. And, you know, just to, and I think that's part of the process of giving them respect as Mm -hmm. separate humans from you. I mean, you know, getting that transition and it reminds me kind of of Jesus, you know, when he went back to his hometown and people are like, isn't that the guy that, you know, wasn't he from Nazareth? Like, isn't he just this kind of small town guy? Like what's so special about him? And just this, and and even his family thought he was kind of crazy and, you know, just to kind of back up and be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to revisit who you are or who you're becoming or who you are going to be. And, allow, allow you to tell me that. And that is important. And I think even as like, I'm my oldest is 16, almost 17. And I'm starting to have those kinds of things where he is different from me in a lot of ways. He's got a lot of opinions already, even though I'm like, where did that come from? Cause I know I told you my opinion and it's different (laughs) and made it clear. (laughs) Right. And, but I like what you said back in the beginning about we love the idea of God giving us free will, but we don't so much love our kids having it. But yeah, so yeah, I like that idea about looking at them kind of from that detached perspective of, of a neighbor. Um, so kind of along the same lines, you, you in, in your conclusion, you give this beautiful picture of just like the prodigal son coming back to his father. And you talk about the part, a big part of loving our kids is releasing them as that prodigal's father did um, and how that leads to praying from a distance. Mm-hmm. I like the way you said that. And that is so hard. Just kind of like looking at them from a distance as a different person from you with different opinions and learning about them is hard, but praying from a distance, maybe when they are ghosting you or mm-hmm. when you're communicating with them, but they're far away and you just have no idea you know, the tip of the iceberg of the mistakes they're making or the beliefs that you believe are wrong thinking, but you know, there's this whole world of that they're living apart from you. Um, So do you have any advice for how to pray at a distance without losing hope, whether it's in a time of silence from that child or a time where it just looks like there's no movement, no matter, you know, you're banging down heaven's door every day for them. And it just seems like everything is maybe even getting worse. What, what advice do you have for us when that happens? I think part of that is understanding American Christianity, which is I prayed something once and I want it now. (laughs) So we think that God's supposed to answer us immediately. I just had a prayer that I prayed for 40 years answered in 2022, a 40 year prayer. Oh my God. And it's been a miracle, Praise God. but there are definitely times in that 40 year prayer time where I was like, I don't even know if God's listening. You know, this, this is very frustrating. And I, I mean, I even got to the place where I despaired and thought it'll never be answered. And I'll just have to live with the fact that it won't be answered. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things is to take the long view to know that your child is on a journey. It may be a year from now that they come back. It, you may not even see it this side of heaven. I don't know. You might pass away before that prayer could be answered. And we don't know what the outcomes are, but we are not called to, to, um, orchestrate outcomes. That's the Holy spirit's job. We are called to be faithful in prayer. And I think that's where we learn perseverance in prayer and, um, to try to view it as a challenge instead of a no. So if you're not getting an answer to that prayer right now, God is teaching you patience and it's a challenge to keep going instead of seeing it as a discouragement because we 
cannot know and we cannot see all the things God is doing. Another thing that we can do is to ask God to show us little things. And he's been so faithful to answer that prayer where I, you know, I'm praying for a particular child and one little thing will happen. It's small, it's tiny, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And I just cling to it. Um, Those things I think will help you in persevering in prayer for them. That's become one of my favorite prayers in recent years is just, just God, give me a, just a glimpse, just give me a little glimpse of the work that you're doing to keep me going. Cause I know it's there, you know, I know it's happening, but I just can't see it. And I just, in just being honest in my humanness, I am tempted to give up when I don't see Mm -hmm. that movement happening, Mm -hmm. even though I know it's there. So that is a really powerful prayer to pray. Um, I have kind of a, I didn't give you a heads up on this one, but it just got me thinking you were talking about how we've forgotten how to listen just in our culture. And I feel like that translates to our prayer lives too. What do you think about that? Just in terms of like, do you think that what is the role of listening to God as we pray for our wayward kids and how can we kind of relearn or train ourselves back into listening to God? I I do think that has, has to do with solitude and quiet and turning off devices and taking walks in the woods or around your house somewhere and spending quiet moments because in the cacophony of social media and the doom scrolling that we do, we're not going to hear from the Lord because it occupies our mind. So taking time out is really important and, and asking the Lord too to give you a better listening muscle, um, And to begin to, one way to help that is to begin to record it. So when you have heard something very clearly from the Lord in scripture or in your mind, write it down so that you can have this testimony of God's kindness to you and speaking to you. Um, I think that will encourage you when you have those discouraging days of God never speaks to me. He never answers prayer, but then you have this written record of, oh no, wait, he has, and he does. I love that because there are times I've written things down that I'd forgotten that I even wrote mm-hmm. and then you see them and it's like, Whoa, God did that. Like I asked for that. That's awesome. So it is, but I think you're so right with the need to be intentional about turning everything off. And I have to do this sometimes in the car. I'll do it. If I'm alone and my kids are old enough now that I can leave our oldest with all of them if I need to go to the store or, you know, if, if I need to go on an errand or do something, I'm in the car alone now sometimes, whereas when they were little, I wasn't. And so I've been really conscious about just turning the radio off because I like listening to news. I like listening to music. And, um, sometimes though, it's just, you, you don't have to fill every, just because it's available doesn't mean you have to fill every moment. I love listening to podcasts and audiobooks while I'm cleaning the house or folding laundry or doing whatever. And, but just, I have to remind myself sometimes you don't have to always have input because I think you're right when we, we need that space and then we can start training ourselves to listen, (laughs) but it takes that like train that, that white space first. So it's yeah. not always easy to do when there's so much input at our fingertips all the time. Uh, so how do you know when it's time to speak truth to our adult kids, especially like if we see them making poor choices or rejecting the truth and when to be silent and just pray, is there a time to speak that truth or is it just always time to, to give them space or How can we know that difference? My rule of thumb, and this isn't like a biblical mandate or anything, but when you do have a conversation and something comes up is to say what you believe once and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Most likely they already know what you're going to say, but just make it clear. Um, You can simply say something like, Hey, I really appreciate you asking that question this is where I've come and my reading of the scriptures, and this is where I stand. Um, and I love you. <laughs> so, uh, that, and that's really it that you don't need to keep, you know, well, and here's the other thing I researched and here's 10 more things that I, here's an article I want you to read and look yeah, at this the article, Facebook page. the old yeah, forwarding the article. Trick. Yeah, don't yeah. <laughs> say it once, trust God. He's got it all under control and he doesn't need your help Just say it once. And then you don't need to say it again. 
That's good. And yeah, that that's really good advice. That's very good. It's not just don't say it. Don't just avoid the conflict or whatever. But uh, and I love the how you followed up with I love you. And I love you just like just to let you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that you talk about that, that Alana and I have talked about on the podcast before is, so you talk about this role of hardship, the, the role that famine played in bringing the prodigal home. Like it took that famine, that rock bottom to get him to realize that he left a good thing and that he had made a mistake. Um, and in the book, you mention about how you're not, you know, you're not necessarily one to pray calamity on your kids, but that there is a place like, how do you, and how don't you personally pray for your kids to come to a place where they find themselves at the end of themselves to return to God or do you? I, I definitely pray that way, but not in a punitive way, because I right. think we can kind of be like, well, strike them Lord. And we don't want that. <laughs> um, but you know, there was really no striking that happened with the prodigal son. It was just the world that he lived in. And I think that's where, when there was no famine in the land, the world that he lived in was super fun and really awesome. Lots of friends partying all the time, super great. So what we can pray is that the world would, that it's, it's weird um, masquerade would be unmasked oh, and that, so you know, good. that, you would pull away that God would pull away that mask and, or another way to look at it is in the parable of the soil. When the seed falls among the thorns, sometimes I will pray, Lord, let the thorns be thorny. Um, let them see the reality of the emptiness of their pursuit mm -hmm. and let me see it too. When I'm doing the same thing, because I'm, I'm a human being as well. And I tend to pursue things that don't fill me up, but I think they will because I keep trying. So, you know, there's a posture of humility there as well. That is, I, I love that wording, just that the mask would be removed. I, I really think that that's powerful just in anything that we pray, just to pray that lies would be exposed, that deception would be unmasked. And yeah, that's great. Well, do you have any, any final words of encouragement about prayer for parents and grandparents who find themselves? I just, as an aside, I thought it was hard, you know, this idea of parenting a child that's an adult once they leave and you have no, you know, no control over where they go, what they do. But then I, then I started thinking about what being a grandparent, mm -hmm. that's like a whole other level of letting go. So just for, I know a shout out to all the grandparents out there too. We know it's hard. We know it's hard. So what are any final words of encouragement about just praying for your children and your grandchildren when they're out of your grasp. <laughs> yeah, I actually have some um, something to help people with. So if people go to marydemuth.com slash LPL for Love, Pray, Listen, um, I have uh, 52 prayers that people can pray and there's blanks. You can put your child's name in those blanks, a prayer a week for your adult child or for your grandchildren. Um, and so that's absolutely free. But if you want it in card form, you can go to marydemuth.com slash art. And I've got 52 physical cards, four by six, that you can just rotate throughout the year and pray over your adult children. Because I think a lot of people have a hard time putting words to their prayers. So I've created it free and also as a product. I love that. And just for those of you listening or watching, Mary's art is incredible. You need to follow her on Instagram. That is a nice little segue into our next <laughs> question. Where can they find you? But your Instagram, oh, I just, I watch it and I watch you painting and it's just, it's like a breath of fresh air. It's beautiful. And I loved your Mary Magdalene. I think that was mm -hmm. today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. So where can, where can they find, um, find you online and on Instagram um, and social media? Yeah. So as I mentioned, marydemuth.com and then it's at Mary Demuth on Instagram. And then I have a podcast that is of particular interest to people who like to pray. It's called pray every day dot show. You can listen to it wherever podcasts are. And it is, we we're going to celebrate five years, February 1st, and uh, we're hitting, uh, I'm going to be hitting 4 million downloads soon. And the four, congratulations, know, so, so oh. crazy. But it's super simple. Five minutes. I read a chapter of the Bible in order 
And then I pray for you according to that chapter, five minutes long. So I'm praying scripture over you. And if you feel like there's no one out there praying for you, I will pray for you. And I love praying for you. So that's prayeveryday.show. I can't believe I didn't mention that in our introduction, that you're also a <laughs> podcaster on top of all the other things. That's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Mary. I know this, this has just been great talking to you. And I know that it's been a blessing to so many people. So um, how can we pray for you today? You pray for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to keep the the right thing, the right thing to honor Jesus and to listen to the Holy Spirit, particularly when I am just like going throughout my day and sometimes the Holy spirit will say random things to me, like go pray for that random person. And I just want to be that person who obeys and does scary things like that. I love it. Well, thank you, Mary. And God bless you. We'll close in prayer here. Okay. God, we just thank you so much for Mary. Thank you for her talent, her art. Thank you for her words, her wisdom. Thank you for the experiences that you've given her that led to writing this book and just her passion for prayer. We just pray, God, that you would rain blessing down on her. We pray that you would make your voice the one that she hears above all others, that all of the noise of the world would just pale in comparison to your guiding voice, giving her the next steps to take giving her the next assignment, whether it's something small or something huge, something scary or something every day, God, that she would just be in your path, just walking in your path completely and fully. And, and that she would just be blessed by that Lord, that people around her would just see her obedience and would be encouraged and inspired by it. Father, we just lift up her family to you and pray that you would rain down blessings on them. Um, we just pray in Jesus name that you would just allow your Holy Spirit to be present in her home, on her family members, wherever they are, and, um, and just on her ministry and in her work. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.